Well, hello everyone, it's Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. And on today's episode, we're going to ask a simple question. How would you like to become a mercenary in the 16th century? Okay, now I say that, but I don't actually know who would really need to know this information. It seriously makes me wonder, what the hell am I doing with my life? Like, okay, maybe in a post-apocalyptic future, we are all going to revert back in time, and people are suddenly having to use older technology, and you're going to need to figure out how to become a mercenary or something in order to survive. If you even can, that is. But rather than figure it out then, why don't you figure it out? now by studying history. Again, I wonder what it is that I am doing with my life. So on that note, today we're going to be talking about the Landschnecks, the uh, the very fun and very colorful German mercenaries of the 16th century, who kind of look like what would happen if uh, you had Gucci LARPers who were also trained to kill people. You see, my friends, Landschnecks had adopted the very early Renaissance tactic of massed pikemen formation, something that was very well popularized by Swiss mercenaries at the time. But also simultaneously, they tended to carry more mixed roles within their ranks, things like Doppelsoldner, literally double pay soldiers who used great swords along with halberdiers for shorter range closer combat and arquebusiers or gunmen who would provide a little bit of that range edge that you possibly need and thus these were a type of soldier that could effectively do anything the question becomes how exactly do you become one well you see my friends one of the weird things was that you actually needed some degree of money before you could become a soldier for hire in the first place here because you see as opposed to peasants it was actually more of the middle class city apprentices that were more commonly going to be going off and joining the Lanschnecks or you had the second or third sons of nobles who perhaps due to their family circumstances, they weren't actually going to receive an inheritance. So they decided that a soldier for hire was going to be something that was going to be better. Something where the potential for pay and plunder was something that was going to draw a lot of people in, but you had to have at least a degree of investment before you could actually get into it. In fact, the extremely poor folks tended to be weeded out of the Lanschnecks rather quickly because in order to be able to join them in the first place, you had to first pay for your own equipment, which typically would cost around 14 guilders. You would then receive your monthly allowance over time of four guilders, which eventually would pay you back, but simultaneously that means that you had to have the funds in the first place to be able to get said equipment. And for a lot of guys in the beginning, this was actually worth it, as your pay was typically higher than what it would be as a simple shopkeeper inside of a city, at least in the early years. Later on, it would not be this case, and this is actually going to be one of the things that would lead to the downfall of the Lanschnecht in the first place. So hey, you could go into debt, but you could potentially get a great job and pay out just as you can with modern university, or you could die miserable and in debt, just like in the case of modern university. Huh, maybe things aren't so different after all. And so thus, the ranks of the Lanschnecht were more often than not formed by the more relatively well-off members of society versus the poorer parts, but simultaneously, your economic health is not the only thing that would determine whether or not you were going to be able to get in in the first place. You also, at the same time, had to prove your fitness and also that you had a degree of understanding and social bearing to the Obris. This is the person that was the recruiter of the company. After all, you didn't want any uh, riffraff to get in there and kind of ruin the reputation of your prized mercenary group. If you manage to get all of your equipment and simultaneously pass all inspections, then at that point, you might be presented with a contract in order to be employed, because in the end, that's actually what you were. You were an employee. An employee who was trained to kill people, of course, but still an employee nonetheless. Like, god dang it, imagine that being your 9 to 5. I mean, this was a document that would not only highlight your payment and length of your service, but it would simultaneously mention different things, like the terms of engagement, the different judicial codes, meaning like the art of war, like the, the codes and rules of war that you had to follow, and also the names of your abrist as well as the other commanding officers of the formation that you were going to be serving in. Now, interestingly enough, those articles of war that you agreed to that you had to follow had some rather interesting caveats that you don't really think about that a mercenary at this time would follow. As an example, Lanschnecks were expected to protect women, children, old people, the property of the church, which is very ironic considering that in 1527, uh, Lanschnecks would go down and literally burn down the Vatican and take the Pope and ransom him. You know, just little ironic things like that. But of course, this also ties back to the fact that you were expected to pay for goods when you were in friendly territory, but if you were not in friendly territory, then as most mercenary companies went, it was pretty much free game. That all being said, one of the interesting things about the Lanschnecht is that technically speaking, they were only supposed to plunder when they were told that they were able to do so. I don't really know how often that would happen in terms of war, because again, we're talking about a mercenary company. They were also simultaneously expected to limit their gambling and alcohol consumption. But again, we're talking about soldiers. 
That typically doesn't happen. And also when you consider that these were mercenaries that literally would fight and kill for coin, well, let's just say historically that when it comes to that, uh, this is not a group of people that would typically be holding themselves back the most. Like that, that didn't really happen. Historically speaking, they didn't really care about property rights or collateral damage. That wasn't really a factor to be considered. But furthermore, one of the rules of the Lanshan Act was that they were not to desert or run away from the battlefield on pain of execution, which is a natural thing among all armies. Even if his payment was delayed. After all, again, we're talking mercenaries. Though weirdly enough, one of the rules that they would have within certain mercenary companies was that they would put in a limitation on that time. Like if you wanted to be a mercenary, but they didn't pay you after like two weeks, then for some of them, it was pretty much free game to desert. And then they would go and burn and loot and do whatever they could to the surrounding territories to recoup some of their losses on their way home. Yeah, paying and controlling mercenary forces throughout history has uh, consistently been a problem for many, many, many rulers. And especially at this time in the 16th century. And so it was that if you wanted to be a Lanschnecht, you would need to have money in the first place, a somewhat decent social background, at least in the beginning, be physically fit and knowledgeable about your weapon of choice, and also simultaneously, perhaps most importantly of all, have the patience to not immediately abandon everything when there is inevitably going to be some kind of delay in you getting paid. If this sounds fun to you in the modern day, then hey, you might make it as a Lanschnecht and, you know, suffer from inflation and uh, cheap labor that would eventually, just like in the case of some modern economies, also end up being the downfall of the Lanschnecht. But hey, this has been Sakuyi with the History of Everything. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Please let me know what kind of questions and other things you have uh, in the comments below so that we can go in and make more videos and answer more things. I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And again, let me know whatever it is that we should do next. I will see you all next time. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day and goodbye, everyone.